All right. Hello and welcome to another Move with a Doc. I'm Dr. Rupa Shah, board certified family physician and obesity medicine specialist. And today we're going to actually talk about a very devastating event that can very severely affect young people, um, sort of in the prime of their life, but also impact folks in their older years. And that is a stroke. So stroke actually ranks as the fourth leading killer in the United States of America. Each year, 795,000 Americans have a stroke um, and about 160,000 dying from stroke-related causes. So um, pretty big impact on folks. Um, what I wanna talk about today are some of the risk factors of a stroke, what you personally could do to prevent a stroke, and then I think one of the biggest things is how to recognize if you or a loved one or somebody around you is actually having a stroke um, because time is brain. Um, so you really want to act fast. Um, so first of all, let you know, I think there's still a little bit of confusion of what is a stroke. You hear different things. Um, and I think there's just always a little bit of confusion of what actually is a stroke. A stroke, you can think of it as almost kind of akin to, you know, we talk about a heart attack, which is a vascular event of the heart, um, but a stroke is really a brain attack. So this occurs when the blood circulation in our brains fails, um, and then brain cells die from the decreased uh, blood flow um, and the resulting lack of oxygen. So it's actually brain tissue dying, so a brain attack. Where the confusion, I think, comes in is that there's actually two different um, major kind of categories, two broad categories of strokes. Those that are caused by a blockage of the blood flow and those that can cause bleeding into the brain. So two different things, a blockage of the blood flow and then bleeding into the brain. And so these are an ischemic stroke where there's a blockage of blood flow in the brain or a hemorrhagic stroke where a vessel bleeds into a large portion of the brain. So an ischemic stroke is actually the most common. 80% of the cases are ischemic strokes. The blockage of blood vessel in the brain or the neck are carotids right in through here. And you can always feel your carotid pulse. Um, that is um, the cause of an ischemic stroke. Uh, again, these are 80% of the cases of stroke are ischemic strokes. And the blockages can stem from three different conditions. You can have the formation of a clot within a blood vessel, um, either in the brain or in the neck, um, and that's called a thrombosis. Um, you can have a movement of a clot from one part of the body, like the heart is a very common area will, where a tiny clot will move, travel up, and then into the brain, uh, and that's called an embolism, or what people refer to as an embolic stroke, or you can have a very severe narrowing in an artery, uh, sometimes and often the carotids. So we have two you know, carotid arteries um, and we would call this a carotid stenosis or a narrowing. Um, and so you get sort of that blockage again of that blood flow. Again, all of these result then in an ischemic stroke. The other type is a little bit more straightforward. Bleeding into the brain um, or the spaces surrounding the brain causes a second type of stroke that I was talking about, which is a hemorrhagic or bleeding type of brain. These are rare, but extremely devastating because they always occur. Uh, they generally affect a very large portion um, of the brain. Um, so important to just know that ischemic strokes are the most common, 80% caused by thrombus, emboli, and narrowing, okay? So what are some of the risk factors of a stroke? That's um, what I kind of want to move into because there are a lot of them, um, and some of them are modifiable, so that's important for us to know personally. Um, but let's start the ones we can't change. So age. We can't change our age. Stroke does occur in all different age groups, but the risk of stroke doubles for each decade between the ages of 55, so 55 and 85. Gender, we can't change that. Men have a higher risk of stroke um, in young and middle age, but the rates do even out into the older ages, and then more women tend to die from strokes, and some of that has to do with some hormonal, hormonal changes, menopausal changes, um, and same sort of risks uh, for women go up uh, with heart disease and heart attacks. So um, again, potentially due to changes with um, menopause. 
another non-modifiable risk factor is race. Uh, people from certain ethnic groups do have a higher uh, risk of stroke. Uh, for example, African-American stroke is more common and more deadly, even in young and middle ages, um, than for any other ethnic or racial group in the, in the United States. And then the last one, so it's important, again, to know your family history if you can, um, but stroke does seem to run in some families. And so having a family history of stroke can put you at risk um, and contribute to familial strokes. So uh, there may be a uh, kind of a familial tendency uh, for stroke risk factors. You could have an inherited predisposition for high blood pressure or diabetes, and then those are risk factors that, that lead to stroke. So a family history of stroke is also important. So those were non-modifiable, but you're thinking, well, what are the ones that I can change? What are modifiable risk factors? Well, high blood pressure, so hypertension. Now we can't always avoid hypertension, but it is by far the most potent uh, risk factor for stroke. Hypertension actually causes a two to four fold increase in the risk of stroke before the age of 80. So if your blood pressure is high, if you don't know your blood pressure, go see your you know, primary care provider, have a physical. It's good to know what your numbers are for your, um, for your blood pressure numbers. The top number being the systolic, the bottom number being the diastolic. Um, and if those numbers are running high, definitely talk to them about treatment. Um, diet is important in high blood pressures, cutting down on salt, eating more fruits, more vegetables, foods that are higher in potassium exercising, um, all of these things can contribute to lowering your blood pressure. Um, but of course, some people will need medication and that's where you need to talk to your provider. Um, and remember, controlling your blood pressure is also gonna help control heart disease, prevent diabetes, uh, kidney failure, and lots of other medical problems, but definitely also a stroke. Um, I will mention, of course, cigarette smoking. Uh, we know this causes about a two-fold increase in the risk of ischemic stroke and up to a four-fold increase of a hemorrhagic stroke, the type where you bleed into your brain. So it's been linked, of course, cigarette smoking to the buildup of that fatty substance, the atherosclerosis, as we cause, call it, um, in our carotid arteries. That's why I keep pointing here. These are carotid arteries. So think of the placking that can occur from smoking, high cholesterol, um, and blockage of that artery is one of the most common um, causes of stroke in Americans. Uh, we know nicotine raises blood pressure. So we just talked about hypertension, but uh, smoking also contributes to that. Um, can also make your blood a bit thicker, more likely to clot. Um, and we know that nicotine and smoking can contribute to aneurysm formation. These are little uh, dilated blood vessels in our brain can lead to hemorrhagic strokes when those little aneurysms burst and they, they bleed into your brain. And of course, we know that cigarette smoking contributes to total body inflammation. And of course, getting a stroke, there is some inflammatory changes that occur to have these um, little pieces of clot break off um, and things like that. So inflammation is very important in the pathogenesis of a stroke. Um, another risk factor, of course, is heart disease. So um, coronary artery disease, uh, which is, again, placking of the arteries um, in our heart, in our carotids, uh, having valvular defects in your heart, um, an irregular heartbeat, like atrial fibrillation, we'll talk about that more later, and even having an enlargement of your heart uh, or congestive heart failure. All of these things can result in blood clots Okay, blood clots that can break loose and then they can um, travel upstream and then block one of the vessels um, in your brain. And again, that is an ischemic stroke. So let's just mention atrial fibrillation is one of those um, causes of heart disease. Very prevalent in older people. You may know somebody who has atrial fibrillation it is actually responsible for one in four strokes after the age of 80. Um, and it's associated with a very high mortality um, and disability rate. The most common blood vessel disease is actually atherosclerosis though, which is just hardening of the arteries, placking of the arteries, whatever you wanna call it. We know hypertension, the high blood pressure actually leads to the promotion of atherosclerosis um, and causes mechanical damage to, those, to, those, um, to the walls of those blood vessels. Again, more inflammation. Um, and so you can talk to your doctor uh, again about if you have, um, atherosclerosis, high, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, uh, all of these, again, are risk factors for a stroke. So 
Um, another risk factor, and this one sounds a little silly, but if you've had a history um, of a TIA or a stroke, a TIA um, is kind of people call it a mini stroke. Uh, it actually stands for a transient ischemic um, event. Um, you can have these symptoms of a stroke, uh, but they don't last very long. So if you've had a TIA or a stroke, your risk of having a stroke is many times greater than someone who's never had one of these events. Um, of course, diabetes um, is another uh, risk factor. Uh, you can think that this, you know, you might think diabetes really is just all about blood sugar, um, insulin, um, and your body's ability to use that, but it's really more than that. It causes and I, we've mentioned this before, it's a really, I like to think of it as a, a vascular, a vasculopathy. Um, it really causes a lot of destruction and inflammation. I keep harping on that word inflammation, but it causes a lot of inflammation in the blood vessels um, throughout the body, including the brain. Don't forget about the brain. We always think of these things in terms of our heart, but there's a lot going on in the brain as well. So there is inflammation overall in all of the blood vessels in your body. Um, and that is a big problem with diabetes. Um, also, if the blood glucose levels are high at the time of a stroke, the brain damage sometimes can be more severe and more extensive than when blood glucose is well controlled. So another reason that if you have diabetes to really manage those blood sugars and control your hemoglobin A1C. We also know high blood pressure sometimes goes hand in hand with diabetes, um, and that could be another risk factor that just contributes to the higher risk of stroke in people with diabetes. So again, keeping your diabetes under well control, having a low uh, A1C less than 7%, 7.5% if you're older, really can delay the onset of complications and the increased risk of stroke. Um, Another risk factor, I just mentioned it earlier because these are all sort of intertwined together, but hyperlipidemia, having high cholesterol. So low density lipoprotein, LDL, that's that number on your cholesterol panel. The LDL cholesterol carries cholesterol, which is the fatty substance of your blood and um, carries that and delivers it to our cells. But the excess LDL is what can cause that cholesterol to build up um, in the blood vessels. And that's what leads to atherosclerosis, or um, we can call it coronary artery disease, placking, um, CVD, uh, cardiovascular, we call it all sorts of things, but basically all that excess LDL is clogging up the arteries of our heart and our carotid arteries right here. So major, major cause of blood vessel narrowing um, and can lead to both, of course, a heart attack, but also a brain attack or a stroke. Um, but the secondary issue again with atherosclerosis or high cholesterol is what? is inflammation. It really does cause total body inflammation in all of the vessels, but particularly the heart and the brain and the carotid. So think about inflammation and what we want to do is decrease that inflammation. And then of course, a final risk factor I'll just mention is physical activity, physical inactivity and obesity. So obesity and inactivity um, are associated with all of the things we just mentioned, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, uh, the waist circumference to hip circumference um, ratio equal to a, or above the mid value for the population does increase your risk uh, for having an ischemic stroke about three fold. So that's pretty big. Um, and we've talked about this before, but obesity, adipose tissue itself is a very active endocrine organ, and it's a source of lots of inflammatory cytokines and um, inflammatory markers. So again, I'll harp on it one last time, but this contributes to total body inflammation, particularly the heart and the brain. Um, so we talked about risk factors, those that we could change, those that we couldn't, um, but I think what's really important too is uh, what are the symptoms of a stroke? Uh, you really want to recognize this in yourself or in somebody that you live with or a family member, coworker. This can happen anytime, anywhere. And every second, every minute that goes by is brain tissue that we can, um, that we can save um, and that can affect somebody's total uh, mortality and morbidity from a stroke. So 
you may have heard this acronym, but it's called uh, acronym, but it's called Be Fast, um, and that's just a reminder of the stroke signs and symptoms. So, B stands for balance. Uh, is that person suddenly having trouble balancing, coordination, having trouble walking, uh, dizzy, weak, uh, noticing that they're spinning? Okay, so that's the B for balance. Eyes, are they suddenly um, feeling like they can't see? Their blurry vision, double vision, sudden loss of vision in one or both eyes, like a tunnel vision um, without any pain, that can be assigned a as well. Uh, we, we all know this one, but F, face drooping. So if suddenly you see um, that one side of the face is drooping or they feel like it's numb, you can ask that person to smile. It's a quick and easy, just have them smile. Make sure both sides of their smile um, go up. You can ask them to uh, stick their tongue out. You should make sure it's midline. It's not deviating to like the left or the right. Um, that can be a sign of a stroke. So A is arm weakness. Um, do they feel like that they can't move one side of their arm? They feel weak. Uh, they have trouble raising their arms. You can just ask them, like, raise both your arms up. And does one arm tend to drift downwards? That's a sign that they're having weakness. S is speech difficulty. So is their speech slurred? Are they unable to speak? Are they hard to understand? They're slurring. Um, you can ask them to repeat a simple sentence. The sky is blue. If they can repeat it correctly, maybe they're not. If they're having difficulty, it sounds slurred. Um, you know, you may want to get the medical attention right away. They may even just have sudden onset of confusion. They're not making sense. They can't find their words. These can all be symptoms of a stroke. And then T is time to call 911. Don't wait. Don't have someone drive them. You need to call 911. We have... Um, and if, if someone has any of the symptoms, the 911 paramedics, we have a stroke protocol um, uh, that is activated at the hospital with a stroke team waiting to evaluate them quickly. Um, so you want to get them to the hospital immediately. You do not want to drive them. Um, other symptoms I'll review real quick. And we mentioned this, some of these, but sudden numbness of an arm, leg, especially if it's one side of the body, sudden confusion trouble walking, understanding speech, slurred speech, um, trouble seeing. Again, we talked about vision, double vision, blindness, tunnel vision. Um, if they say they feel a curtain coming down over their eyes, uh, that's a trouble sign. Um, trouble walking, feeling like they're going to fall to one side, loss of balance and coordination. Um, and then a sudden severe headache you know, with no known cause. So we often ask too, as we're triaging patients, is this the worst headache of your life. Don't wait, call 911 and get to the ER. Um, that can be a, a sign of a, of a hemorrhagic stroke. So just like with a heart attack, women can experience signs of a stroke a little bit differently than men. They could have some more subtle symptoms. Uh, they may have some more generalized weakness. Um, they may be disoriented or just a bit confused, knowing, um, having sudden onset of memory problems. Uh, fatigue, nausea, vomiting. So really just important to be on the, be on the lookout and have a, a low threshold for thinking someone's having a stroke. Uh, so some of these can really be um, brushed off uh, or missed if you're not thinking about it. So um, again, if you think somebody uh, at your home, at your workplace is having a stroke, it is best to call 911 and to get them to the ER as quickly as possible. Um, so what can you do today um, after listening to this talk? I mean, you know, I like kind of actionable things that people can do. So uh, number one, treat your high blood pressure. Uh, that's what I would do. So if you think you have high blood pressure, if you don't know your numbers, get into your doctor to see if you have high blood pressure. Um, An ideal blood pressure is 120 over 80, but talk to your physician about what your goal blood pressure should be. Uh, for some people, they wanna be a little less aggressive, but um, just knowing those blood pressure numbers can be um, really important. Having severe systolic high blood pressure over 200s is a risk for having a hemorrhagic stroke or the type where you can bleed. It's just a high pressure in the brain and you can burst one of those blood vessels in your brain. Um, 
I'll just quickly mention, I'm always surprised when I diagnose people with hypertension in the office, I put them on a blood pressure medication, and then I don't see them again. Um, if you get diagnosed with high blood pressure, um, it's important to come back in and do a follow-up with your physician or do a blood pressure visit um, because there's no point in taking a blood pressure medication if it's not truly controlling your hypertension. So come back in, get it monitored, and, and make sure that we are treating your blood pressure to goal. Remember, high blood pressure, hypertension is the silent killer. You're not necessarily going to feel that your blood pressure is high. Um, so that's one thing I want to mention. If you're overweight, do work on the weight loss. Um, obesity, uh, definitely, um, especially the complications even linked to it, including, of course, high blood pressure, diabetes, does raise your odds of having a stroke. Um, and remember, it's not getting down to a normal weight. It's losing as little as 10 to 15 pounds can even have a significant impact on reducing your risk of having a stroke. Exercise. Um, exercise isn't the best first step, obviously, for weight loss, but it does contribute to losing weight and lowering your blood pressure. So it does stand on its own as an independent stroke reducer. So while I don't just say exercise, definitely all for weight loss, but just that aerobic activity does um, reduce your risk for having a stroke. So it is important to add in a little bit of aerobic exercise. And then this one is always one that people have a hard time, but um, limit your alcohol intake uh, to a few times per week and watch those portion sizes. So a standard size drink is a five ounce glass of wine, not a 10 to 12 ounce glass of wine, um, a 12 ounce beer or a 1.5 ounce glass of hard liquor. So alcohol is inflammatory. Um, also high intake of alcohol itself contributes to atrial fibrillation. I mentioned that earlier. Um, again, why is atrial fibrillation so terrible? Well, it, it is an arrhythmia. Um, and it's a form of an irregular heartbeat. And when your heart doesn't beat regularly and get all the blood out with each, you know, beat of the heart, it, it stays stagnant a bit and forms a clot. It forms a little clot in your chambers of your heart. And then those clots get kicked out at some point up in, you know, to your carotids and into your brain. And that is a stroke. And that's why atrial fibrillation is a problematic thing to have. That's why those folks get put on warfarin or other blood thinners. Um, and it does carry a five-fold increased risk of stroke. And so very, very serious. And we know that alcohol is a strong contributor um, for people with atrial fibrillation. So if you think you have an irregular heartbeat, you're older, you have some heart disease, high blood pressure, other risk factors, definitely do talk to your physician about getting um, an event monitor. That's what we call it. You can wear around an event monitor that can monitor your heart rhythm throughout the day for a week or two weeks, or even three to four weeks at a time to see if you're having episodes of atrial fibrillation, because if you are, you definitely want to get that treated. Um, so I kind of condensed a lot of information um, into this talk. Um, it's getting long, so I don't want to be, uh, belabor it too much. But again, thank you for joining me today. I hope you learned a little bit about the types of strokes, the risk factors, and the things that you personally can do to reduce your risk of having a stroke. So thank you again and have a great day.